And it's uh, June the 8th, uh, 2023. This is Anchored in Hope and Father Larry Richards. And let us pray. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Father God of life and love, we ask you to help us to truly listen to you, to let you form our hearts, form our lives, that we may only do your will. We beg you these things, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So let's go in. Today I want to deal with the Beatitudes. And the reason, because part of their thing is just came out, coming back from the Mount of Beatitudes, the place where Jesus uh, taught everybody the Beatitudes. But too often I think Catholics and others focus on the commandments. And I focus on the commandments constantly when I do an examination of conscience. But I think what Jesus is telling us that we, it goes beyond commandments. And he's telling us about how to be happy. He's telling us about um, putting the world upside down. Too many Christians, Catholics have bought into uh, the teachings of the world and dismissed the teachings of the church. And we got to look at the, or the teachings of Jesus even go deeper. So we got to go, you know, much, much deeper. There was, uh, you know, a Monsignor just uh, talked about all the things that we got to avoid. And, of course, whenever people do this, and he's a very conservative Monsignor, has a big following, uh, you know, focus on sexual sins and everything else. And, of course, of course we got to deal with that. But we also got to deal with the people that aren't taking care of the poor. We got to do all these things because Jesus talks about it. Again, he's the one who talks about who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. And he talks about not taking care of the poor. But the same people that want to say that we have to stand up for the truth and da 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 are the same people that pick and choose what truth they push. And we got to make sure that everything we do is the fullness of the truth, not just our particular view of the church. So, when it comes to morality, when it comes to the way we live our life, we got to go to Jesus. Again, if you are one of those who were with Lent with us, where you read the words of Jesus, the four Gospels for, throughout Lent, then you got to make sure you experienced really what Jesus said, not what someone interprets, not when some bishop or monsignor interpret. And of course, that's important. Of course, they're the uh, monsignors aren't the teachers of the church. The bishops are with the Pope, of course, and we're praying for our Pope who had surgery yesterday, and I hear he's doing quite well. So I put it on my stuff, and all the people have been praying throughout the world, so it's fantastic. So when they they come together as a union, then they're preaching the magisterium of the church, which we've talked about again and again, but not particular ones that say, oh, no, I'm the one who's going to do the magisterium, and they are so off the wall uh, in what they believe and hold themselves up as better than the rest of them, that you can all, always just instantly dismiss them because it's their opinion. Now, again, someone could say the same thing about me, so that's why I always try to go back to, well, let's not focus on what Father Larry Richard says because who cares? Let's focus on what Jesus says because this is our salvation, right? So we always go back to what does Jesus say. So, of course, uh, a couple of the synoptic synoptic Gospels have the Beatitudes, but we're going to focus on Matthew's version of the Beatitudes. So, again, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he explains more. And blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Thus they were persecuted. They persecuted the prophets who were before you. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, here is Jesus teaching the apostles, and of course he's teaching us. What does God, how does God want us to live? How are we blessed? How are we, you know, uh, I heard a homily years ago that they call these, they should be called the be happy attitudes. How to have an attitude that you have a blessed life or a, um, a life that's, uh, uh, you know, filled with peace. And that's what we're looking for. And so we, of course, have to hold up the commandments and because those were given by God. But we have to just to hold up just as highly the Beatitudes of God. Because this is God himself who teaches us. Um, it's just, you know, it's God himself. So when people go and they're fighting with me about Matthew 25, I say, don't fight with me, fight with Jesus. This is Jesus' word. All I'm doing is telling you what Jesus said. You can agree or disagree. It really doesn't matter. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God the universe cannot contain. And you and I will stand before him on judgment day and he will judge us by what he said. So we always got to go back to what Jesus said. So here in Matthew's gospel here, it talks about blessed are the poor in spirit. Now later in the the other gospel, it says uh, blessed are the poor. And, you know, it's easier for us sometimes to deal with Matthew because he's dealing with the Jewish people and he's talking about the poor in spirit instead of just the poor. But again, when we talk about the poor, he's talking about someone who knows that they can't do anything in themselves, that they need God. So to be poor in spirit or to be poor means that you know how much you can't do anything without God's grace. And he said, blessed are you because yours is the kingdom. Because we can't earn the kingdom, we can only receive the kingdom, right? So when we try to sit there and try to earn it, eh, then we're filled with self. And we cannot be filled with self if we expect the kingdom of God. We need to be poor. We need to trust in grace. We need to trust in the power of God, not our strength. We still got to do, you know, I'm reading a, a book on discipline right now. And so it talks about how we got to be disciplined and wake up early, all the things that I try to do. But even that, all the discipline, all the things, all the work means nothing unless you know, but it all depends on God. I can't even take my next breath without God saying, okay, I'll let you have that breath now. That's being poor in spirit, knowing that knowing that you don't know, poor in spirit at the end of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' life, after all the wonderful uh, things he wrote, he said it's all as nothing or hay. It's nothing. You know, that's the humility that can open the kingdom then for you. And so for our own self, am I a man or a woman that's poor in spirit? Again, a person poor in spirit doesn't have time to judge everybody else. We can judge things, of course, but even um, when we realize that, again, this past week a couple people sent nasty things to me on uh, Facebook. or And again, I just go back and I say, may the Lord judge you the way you judge the Pope or you just judged me. And people go crazy. But we got to make sure that we know that God says the measure with which we measure will be measured back to us. Now, again, think of that, the way you and I so pettily judge other people. I do it. And then God says, okay, Larry, you see how you did that? I'm going to do the same thing to you. Oh, God, be merciful. I will. If you're going to be merciful, are you going to be merciful? (sighs) That's poor in spirit, knowing that, okay, I can't be the God of the universe or the Savior of the world. God can be, but I got to sit there and surrender and be poor in spirit before him, trusting in him. Even when you and I say the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, meaning that I'm trusting in God. I can't do it myself. 
And again, when people say, oh, you don't understand, Father. I got money. I'm work. I work hard for everything I get. That's great. But again, God could take your breath now. You could have a stroke now. You could have a heart attack now. And all the things you worked for, all the things you thought you were in control of, when you can't even control your next breath, and neither can I, that's being poor in the spirit when we know that and when we live that. And that comes from somebody who is very much one who likes to be in charge of things. Uh, very much. You've got to know yourself too. huh? So again, so am I a person who wants to be? Again, sometimes I think it's just uh, acknowledging that God can tell me how to live. I don't tell God how to live. I don't let, you know, the latest thing in America tell me how to live. I let God tell me how to live. Period. 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 Do you and I let God tell us how he wants us to live or do we let the world tell us how to live? Our, uh, uh, our Democratic or Republican Party, do they tell us how to live? Do our capitalism, does that tell us how to live? A person who is poor in spirit listens to nobody else except Almighty God. Period. He said gently, kindly, and compassionately. Huh? So are you poor in spirit? Am I poor in spirit? God says, you are blessed if you are and that you get the kingdom of heaven. And isn't that what we all want, to go to heaven someday? Is that what we all want and is that what we're working for? Because that's what God created us for. So first thing I have to examine my conscience about is am I poor in spirit? Next thing, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And you think about when we mourn. Again, this year, I think I've mourned more than I've ever mourned in my life. huh? And God says, you're blessed when you mourn. And again, part of this is a a conversion. So it's not just mourning because we're sad, but it's mourning because we're weeping for our sins. We are uh, repenting of our sins. And isn't that something, if we, again, just focus on, and again, when you go through yourself and you think, well, Father, I'm just not really that sinful. (sighs) Doing things your way instead of doing things God's way is sin, by definition. And again, it can be the way you and I practice our Catholicism, the way you and I say this is the way we must live, whatever it is, um, but we have plenty to mourn about in our sin. So when he talks about this poor in spirit, am I poor enough in spirit that I know I need repentance? Huh? Am I poor enough in spirit that I know I need God to save me because I can't save myself? And I don't think a lot of us get that. A lot of people think, I'm a pretty good person. When I go before God, you know, he's going to say, okay, don't worry about it. You are a good person. Isn't that what... I always hear, but Father, I'm a good person. Of course you're a good person. You know, of course. But that it, God doesn't say good people go to heaven. We have to humble ourselves to enter into the heaven. Being poor in spirit is doing that. We have to mourn over our sins. Huh? It's part of this conversion process. We acknowledge we need God. We repent of our sins. We can't do it ourselves. We mourn over our sins. So again, this is a way of deep conversion in our lives. Huh? And then after he goes to this conversion, because we're going to be comforted because when we repent, when we go to God and, you know, like the prodigal son mourns and says, Lord, I, I God, Father, I'm not worthy to, you know, just call me your thing. And God, uh, the, the Father picks him up and they celebrate. So when you and I mourn from our sins, God picks us up and he comforts us. But the need for repentance is great and not just for those sins the world think are crazy. Again, how does Jesus deal with sin? He goes to the cross, but who is Jesus the most uh, horrible to, if you will? The people that didn't think they had any sin. Very comforting to those who they knew they had sin. Again, Zacchaeus, the woman at the well. Um, the woman uh, who was the whore 
of all those things, watch the way Jesus dealt with them because they were poor in spirit and they would mourn their sins. Do we truly mourn our sins? Not to be focused on our sins, but to be set free from our sins. Again, it's the process of becoming more and more someone who comes to repentance and conversion. And then it says, blessed are the meek. Because again, once you and I have repented and mourned for our sins, then we walk in meekness or humility. Again, uh, not having time, because if you and I are meek, then we are people who are servants of others. And again, I love the, the thing I've seen it many times on the internet, I'm sure you have too, that we should be too busy serving that we have time to judge anybody else. Huh? God will judge all by himself. He doesn't need you to do it. He doesn't need me to do that. The church has gotten the most uh, problems sinfully when we have judged people and killed them for being uh, heretics. And we've done that for centuries. We were wrong when we did that. Now again, you're going to have some people who are watching this who are ultra conservative. And, oh, no, we weren't wrong. We were so and getting them. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. You cannot follow Jesus if you don't have a heart filled with compassion and meekness and humility. There's no room for you to judge. And think about all those cardinals and everybody who did judge. And they had people killed. The way they measured with others was the way God measured unto them. So we got to make sure that once we've converted, once we've humbled ourselves and we walk in this meekness, that then we can enter into all that God wants of us. And we're, you know, again, the promise is, blessed are the meek, for you'll inherit the land, and you'll bring people to God. So we have to walk in this meekness before God. And that happens only if you've come to conversion. Sometimes we hold these up as like entities in themselves and we pick and choose. Nope, nope, nope. It's part of the process of conversion, of entering into God's kingdom. What is necessary? So again, when we look at the commandments, we look at the commandments, that these commandments, you have to follow the commandments to enter the kingdom. Uh, yes. But we got to follow the Beatitudes. This is the way that that's done. This is the way we follow the commandments by living a life beatitude, acknowledging we need to repent, acknowledging and crying for my sins, living a life of service or meekness, that humility thing where I'm serving others, I'm not worried uh, constantly, I'll do anything to save another person instead of sit back and judge other people. Um, so it's part of the reality. And so, and then it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness or for righteousness. That when we have repented, when we have went beyond uh, being people who are focused on our sins, we've repented of them, I'm done, and I'm walking in this humility, that I'm yearning for holiness. And again, people, you've been with me all this time. What is Holiness. When God's will and our will become one. So after you and I have repented and we're seeking and we're repenting and uh, we're crying and then we're being meek, humble, then we hunger for holiness or righteousness and we'll be satisfied. So if you and I uh, have repented, walking with the Lord, and we want to do his will, it will be done. When you desire God's will in your life, then you will live God's will in your life. You will be satisfied. You will get what you want. Again, I was just dealing with my uh, spiritual directees, and I says like to him, I don't give a darn what you want. Do you understand? <laughs> and he looked at me like, you're mean, Father. But I don't. I don't care what he wants. I don't care what I want. I care what God wants. I said, don't you want to stand before God in judgment day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Well, yes, Father. Well, then you got to want his will. And if you want it, you'll get it. You'll live it. You'll do what he wants and you will be blessed and you will attain this righteousness, this holiness. 
But again, is that even part of what you want? Like when I sign any book, you all know by now, I always say, you know, dear Joe, be a saint. Then I'll hand it back. And I'll say, or go to hell. I go, oh, Father. But we've got to be yearning for this holiness, not this self-perfection, because none of us are going to attain that. That's not what holiness is. It's being like God, doing his will. But isn't it amazing when God says we should be perfect? Again, when you read that in the scripture, it's right after he teaches us that we must love our enemies. That's what kind of perfection God is calling us to. Not one that we can look at, look how holy I am. Everybody else, you see how holy I am? You notice I've never been able to be one of do that. <laughs> it just did. He'll say, oh, how father, how father, he's so holy. Oh, shut up. Father is a jackass that God uses for his will. And I seek God's will every day. So that holiness and righteousness will come if I'm seeking his will. But it's not a holiness that draws people to me. It's a holiness that draws me to God. You understand? Holiness is not drawing people to me. Holiness is drawing me to God, doing his will, living for him and him alone. I will be satisfied, he promises. You will be satisfied. So again, is my holiness other-centered, God-centered, or is it having look at people, look at me? Again, sometimes with clergy, we want to dress in a certain way and have people look at us and think we're all holy. Nothing is that this collar I wear, if it draws people to myself, it's doing the wrong thing. It's supposed to be pointing to Jesus, not to me. Some people look at the car and want to spit on it. Some of the people want to worship it. Both are wrong. Always I am as a servant of God and taking people to Jesus. And if the only thing they're doing is looking at me and thinking how holy I am, I am not a servant of God. I'm a servant of my image and myself. Everything got to be pointing to God. So when I wear this and I'm getting angry or when I wear this and I'm getting selfish, or when I'm wearing this, it's a sacrilege because it's only about me, not about he. So again, we got to do this. We got to make sure us priests uh, do this. And again, throughout the, uh, I won't get into it because people will go crazy, but we're not called to draw us to ourselves, but people to draw people to God. Blessed are the merciful because once you've experienced mercy, then what do you want to do? Give it to other people. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. And again, the opposite's true. If you do not show mercy, you will not receive mercy. So I'd always give mercy. It was just something like I put on uh, Facebook the other, not Facebook, I was on there, but YouTube, but one of the things, have I forgiven anyone in my life? And someone says, no, I will not forgive. That. And I'm thinking, Oh, you just damned yourself. You got to get over that. There's nobody you and I can't forgive. Mercy is giving something good to someone who doesn't deserve it. So am I merciful? Because God has been merciful to me. Now I have to be merciful to others. For they will be shown, they will be shown mercy. So if you want to receive mercy, you got to give mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Because a clean of heart person, this isn't just about purity. Oh, I have no sexual thoughts. People of God, I'm very sorry, but I have sexual temptation every day of my life. Hasn't gone away and I'm 63. It's what do you do with it? Purity of heart is just looking for God in all things. Wanting God, and he says, if we are pure of heart, what will happen? We will see God. Now, part of that is that, again, having Sexual temptation is not the same thing as giving in to sin, correct? So the devil tempted Jesus, for goodness sakes. So he'll tempt us. So our hearts need to be purified to seek only, see only God. And that means that we see God in other people. We see God in all of creation. Not pantheism, but all things point to God. All people, especially if they've been baptized, have God dwelling within them. God, we can't even be alive without God breathing his spirit inside of us. So again, do we see God? Because if we are pure of heart and we're looking for God and not just looking for judgment and looking for how people are sinful and looking for all the wrong things, then we will see him. 
around us, and the people, and even in us, if we're looking for God and not just ourselves and to righteousness in ourselves. And then when we see God, because we're pure of heart, we will be peacemakers. We will be people who deal with unity, not disunity. Again and again, there's so many in the church this very moment who call themselves great Catholics that only seek how we're different, how go against the Holy Father, go against the magisterium. That is not a peacemaker. Now, I'm not saying that, oh, it's okay, just do what you want. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that we got to seek God's will, and God's will is, may they be one. So we got to work on unity. we got to work on being a peacemaker. Huh? And again, a part of being a peacemaker is what is peace? It's the pre-fall state. Oneness with God, oneness with others, oneness with nature, oneness with all things. Peace the way it was before the fall. Well, say people say, well, we can't do that because the fall happened. Ah, Jesus Christ died and redeemed us, did he not? So when he leaves us peace, the last gift he gives us, he wants us to bring that peace to others. So, but we can't bring peace to others unless we have peace in ourselves. And that comes from living the Beatitudes. And then finally it says, or not finally, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. I always like this one because throughout the years I have got all kinds of persecution. I'm not complaining. It's part of the promise of God. But again, we'll be persecuted for when we're doing what is right. Of course we will. And then he says, when we do that, for the sake of righteousness, again, it goes back to repentance. We will have the kingdom of heaven. If we get persecuted for what is right. Huh? And then blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you again. And utter every kind of against every kind of... Uh, yeah, every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad again. You're going to rejoice in heaven. Our job is to bring people to Christ. That means, first of all, we have to come to Christ. We have to go into this repentance. And the Beatitudes show us how to live. But it's a process of conversion, deeper conversion into Christ. And if we just push the commandments and give a bunch of rules without teaching people how they are lived by the Beatitudes, then we're putting a heavy burden on people that they cannot carry. All of us need to be poor in spirit, to humble ourselves, to weep over our sins, to be humble in service of others, that meekness, to do all the things that God wants us to do so we can enter the kingdom. It's all by his grace. It's not by us. It's all grace, all grace, all grace. But we got to cooperate with grace. You got it? You get it? Are you going to live it? May you know his love today and forever. Amen.